Hello from a wintry day in Glasgow. I'm going to give you another talk today, this time about the falling rate of profit as understood by Marxist economics. In this talk I intend to cover what the rate of profit is, what controls the rate of profit, what the time dynamics of the rate of profit are. I'll look at the evidence which supports the theory and I'll talk a bit about what the end point of the process of the evolution of the rate of profit is. So first, what is the rate of profit? If we take an individual company into account, its rate of profit is given as a percent, so you might say it's 10% a year. This means that the annual profits of the company are equal to 10% of the capital that it employs. And when you get a rate of profit, it's always given as a percent per unit time, normally a percent per annum. Now, the profit rate is related to the growth rate of capital. In fact, you can look at the profit rate and see it actually as the growth rate of capital. Suppose a capitalist earns 10% on a capital and reinvests it all as profit then clearly in the first year the capital would grow by 10%. Over time she would have the following growth. In the first year she's got £200,000, £20,000 profit reinvested to give £220,000. This time at 10% profit she gets £22,000, reinvests it to get uh, £242,000 of capital and this time gets £24,200 of profit. Now, if the rate of profit remains at 10%, it's clear that the total profit is going to get bigger each year. So, what are the implications of a constant profit rate? If the rate of profit doesn't change, and all the profit is reinvested, then the mass of capital must grow exponentially and from that the sum of annual profit must also grow exponentially. The question is how can this an exponential growth be possible? Can we reconcile such an exponential growth in profit with the labour theory of value? The labour theory of value states that the added value in an industry will be proportional to the labour that it uses, or at least tend to be proportional to the labour that it uses. And we've produced empirical evidence for that in earlier lectures. But our empirical evidence applies to value added in a single year. Now when we're considering the evolution of the rate of profit, we're considering pounds of profit in different years, and the value of money might change from year to year. If the value of money fell, one pound of profit might represent less value in ten years time than one pound of profit does today. In order to compensate or abstract from the effects of inflation, I'm going to be assuming a constant value of money. Now if there is inflation, it can appear to an unwary capitalist that they are making profit when all they're doing is holding on to an asset whilst its price inflates. If all prices are inflating at the same rate, they have not gained by that. So what does the value of money mean? The only coherent meaning you can give for the value of one pound in widely different times is the amount of embodied labour that one pound commands. This was the conclusion that the classical economists arrived at. You can't really compare the purchasing pound of a pound now with one pound a hundred years ago in 1918. Since the goods that you can buy today simply did not exist in 1918. So you can't compare the set of goods that you can buy today and say how much would I have required in pounds to buy them in 1918 because there simply were no iPhones, Big Macs or Volkswagen Polos on the market at that time. 
the only thing that's unchanged since 1918 is human beings and human time. And you can ask how much labour one pound represents. So we'll go back to the previous question. How can an expen exponential growth in profit be possible? Can we reconcile this with the labour theory of value? If value is created by labour, it's clear that there can only be an exponential growth in profit if there is also an exponential growth in the workforce. From this we get Marx's aphorism that accumulation of capital is growth of the proletariat. But what supply? what happens if capital accumulates and there is no growth in the labour force? Suppose the labour force is fixed. Then obviously the amount of capital per worker has to go up. Suppose an average worker produces 30,000 a year, which is sort of plausible for Britain, and that 20,000 of this is wage and 10,000 is profit. And suppose the average amount of capital per worker is £100,000, so the rate of profit would be 10%. If the employers reinvest £10,000 per worker, it's clear that after 10 years the amount of capital per worker would have risen to £200,000 and the rate of profit would now be 10,000 divided by 200,000 which is 5%. So the rate of profit would be half what it was to start out with. Now there may be things which will alter this. The share of income going as wages might decline. There might be changes in the rate of accumulation. They might not accumulate all of it. The population could in fact grow. There could be a growth in the part of the population that is employed relative to the part that is, for example, in an underdeveloped country working on the land as self-employed farmers. And in addition, there's technology changing all the time. So all of these may affect the rate of profit. Suppose the wage share falls by half. So after 10 years wages have fallen to only £10,000 per annum, leaving £20,000 per profit. This would take the rate of profit back up to 10%. Now suppose that the employers reinvest this for 10 more years. Then reinvest 20,000 a year per worker. Clearly after another 10 years the capital stock will have grown to 40,000, 400,000 per worker. At this point, as Marx put it, even if workers could live on air and were paid nothing, the rate of profit must have fallen because if they lived on air, all the value they created, the £30,000 would belong to the employer, but this is now being divided by £400,000 of capital and the rate of profit has fallen to 7.5%. And basically this is why the rate of profit eventually falls. If capital goes on accumulating relative to the workforce that it has, the rate of profit has to fall. Another factor that might happen, though, is that capitalists decide to accumulate less. I have assumed up to now that they reinvest all their profit. But what happens if they decide to spend all their profits on luxury jets, big country houses and lots of bling? Well, under those circumstances, there's no accumulation, the capital stock doesn't rise, and then the rate of profit itself doesn't fall. On the other hand, if they spent half their profits on bling, then the rate of profit will fall only half as fast as it would if they accumulated the lot. The next thing that may alter is the rate of population growth. Suppose the initial rate of profit is 10% of which a quarter is being accumulated. That means the capital stock will be growing at 2.5% a year. Now suppose the working population also grows at 2.5% a year. 
then the rate of profit wouldn't fall because the ratio of capital to labor remains the same and assuming that the division of the the social product between labor and capital doesn't change the rate of profit will be stable if the working population actually grows faster or a larger share of the working population are employees rather than self-employed then the rate of profit can actually rise we see this in practice in countries like Egypt the next factor which may change things is technological advance suppose the productivity of labor rises by two and a half percent a year which is plausible for Britain and the United States that means that in real terms in terms of the labor that they require things are getting cheaper by two and a half percent a year and when we say things are getting cheaper this includes the capital stock which for correct accounting purposes has to be valued at its current cost that is to say the cost it would, it would obtain sold today or bought today so the effect of a two and a half percent rate of technical change is actually to reduce the value of the capital stock by two and a half percent a year and that's the amount it, the capital stock will shrink by in the absence of new accumulation Marx called this devaluation process of capital as a result of technical change moral depreciation which he distinguished from the physical depreciation or physical wear and tear of capital stock in the form of machinery now we can combine all these factors together to get a simple formula which will give us the final rate of profit which I'm showing as P prime P prime is going to equal to G plus T plus D over A now that's only four variables G is the growth of the labor supply T is the rate of technical progress and D is the physical depreciation rate of capital stock and A is the share of profit that is accumulated both T and D are tending to reduce the stock of capital in value terms D is the physical wear and tear T is the effect of technology in devaluing the, share, the capital stock this final rate of profit P prime is what you call in dynamics the attractor of the rate of profit it's the rate towards which the real rate of profit will tend over time it doesn't mean that it's the rate that applies any one year but it means that it moves towards that if the Marxist theory of the rate of profit is a scientific theory it has to be tested we've logically derived a formula from the labor theory of value but does this formula correctly predict the dynamics of the rate of profit in real economies how do you test it well we use the formula to compute the attractor of the rate of profit in a given country we then look at the real rate of profit in that country if the labor theory of value is right then the real rate year on year will move towards the attractor and the attractor will act as a leading indicator of the rate of profit I'm going to show a selection of diagrams that have appeared in articles that I've published with David Zachariah in which we present test cases for a number of economies showing that the labor theory of value correctly predicts the rate of profit the, the nicest example is Japan the solid line here called JPN equilibrium filtered is the attractor for the rate of profit with short-term fluctuations removed the dashed line is the real rate of profit in Japan note that the formula predicts the real rate about four years hence if we look at the re at the real rate there and look back four years or three years sometimes three or four years you see what the the predictor was saying it was going to be so 
it almost exactly predicts the evolution of the real rate of profit. Some very tiny squiggles are mi mixed, missed out, but the overall shape is an almost perfect match two or three years ahead. So this is a very good validation of the Marxist theory of the rate of profit. Britain has a more complicated shape. In this case, the the black line is the actual rate of profit and the blue line is the predictor derived from our formula. Again, the theory correctly predicts how the real rate will move. Starting out, the real rate is falling towards what the predictor says it what the attractor is attracting it to. Then the attractor starts moving up again and the real rate follows and moves up again. The attractor starts falling Shortly afterwards, the real rate starts falling. Note that this has got a very different shape from Japan. In fact, Britain is typical of most European countries. They all have this shape over time. Um, there are some factors which are different between uh, Britain and Japan. The most important difference between Britain and Japan is the there was a big slowdown in accumulation from the time that Thatcher took in about 69 here, 79 there, and there has been a fast growth of the workforce in the UK and both of these tend to depress the rate of profit. Japan of course is famous for having a stagnant labour force. Japanese severely restrict immigration and they have a declining birth rate and a rising death rate. These combine to, to restrict the, the Japanese population. Such rapid growth of the population as did occur in the 1950s and 60s was due to migration from the countryside into the cities and that is long since over. This need for a rapid rate of population growth to hold up the rate of profit is obviously the main reason why the UK government is so keen on expanding the labour force. Now the Marxist theory actually allows you to precisely identify how much each factor contributes to changes in the rate of profit. I'm giving France as an example here. In this case, in black, we have the actual rate of profit. I have a predictor for the rate of profit drawn in blue, which is the predictor using the actual growth of the workforce and the actual rate of technical change. And again, we see this predicts what really happens, just as it did in Britain. And the shape is very similar, though the recovery in profits is not nearly so big as it was in Britain. The green one shows the predicted rate of profit if there had been no labour force growth. So we can see by how much the growth of the labour force in France helped raise the, the, the rate of profit and it was not that much. It was maybe, if we look at the effect there, it's maybe 2% out of a 24% profit rate. The red rate is what the profit rate, the predicted profit rate would have been had there been no technical advance in Japan, no increase in the productivity of labor. Now we can see this is markedly lower than the um, actual rate, very markedly lower. But it still has the same shape, a decline followed by a rise. So this rise here is the rise associated with neoliberalism and the declining rate of accumulation which hit all the European countries as a result of that where the bourgeoisie slowed down their rate of accumulation in favour of luxury consumption. What are the lessons we can draw from this? Again, Marxist economics comes out trumps. It explains what's happening and makes testable future predictions. It says that developed capitalism has a low birth rate and this implies stagnant population rates as in Japan unless either there is a lot of immigration 
or technology speeds up a lot compared to what it is now or accumulation comes to a halt and the capitalist class spend their profits on luxuries. At the moment spending their profits on luxuries is their preferred way of raising the rate of profit. 